This time it's part two of our Triumph Buyer's Guide, where we look at the Triumphs built at Meriden in the years following World War II. By the end of World War II, Triumph earned their new home at Meriden. Production of the 350 single continued for a small while after World War II, but soon died off. The Speed Twin came back in 46, but little changed, apart from the introduction of hydraulically damped front forks, of course. The beautiful maroon coloured paint scheme was back, with a nice chrome finish too. Pool petrol did affect performance, but these were still good machines. The Speed Twin would soon be joined by a new 350cc parallel twin, the 3T. This was actually not a sleeve down Speed Twin, but used an engine which in some ways was similar to the 3TW prototypes that were destroyed in the war. Production of these wouldn't last too long, being squeezed out by demand for the Speed Twin and the new sportier model, the T100. Early post-war machines were of course much sought after and well put together machines. This of course makes them fairly expensive, so they're probably best avoided if you're on a bit of a budget. But there are a very fine range of machines based on the 500 platform from this period. Everything from trail bikes to road racers, some of which even use the aluminium engine that came from the generator set used during the war. The sporty T100 of this period used an all aluminium engine, so it was light and very fast particularly if you fitted the factory supplied race kit. This included a non-restrictive exhaust, twin carbs and hot cams, all you needed to go racing with your 500 twin. Nineteen fifty seven would see the introduction of the three TA, or twenty one, depending on which market you're in. This was a three fifty CC parallel twin and the first bike to fit a unit construction. One of the most notable things about these bikes was the pressed steel all enclosed bodywork. It was described as a bike with a wheel and tomorrow. The pressings weren't universally popular and many people would remove them to make the bike look more classic and a little bit more sporty. These days of course ironically people really covet a machine that's still got these pressings on and a bike that still has all its original fittings commands much higher prices than one that does not. The 350 is quite mildly tuned, only making around 17.5 horsepower, so it revs fairly low and produces fairly low levels of vibration. Weak points are the distributor-like electrical system that was used to time the sparks, this was never particularly accurate or reliable, and of course the frame, which unbelievably uses the fuel tank as a stressed member. This thing is just a little bit too flimsy, so the frame once naked looks rather swan neck like and really isn't rigid enough for a machine of this type. Thankfully, the bike isn't too sporty, but as we got into the more sporty models, the frame really was a problem. On the heels of the new 3TA came an all-new 5TA. This was of course closely based on the 21, with its unit construction, and used the same frame, with all its flimsiness. But of course that extra CCs gave it a little bit more go, but it was really designed as a touring bike and was a very good all-round machine. More excitingly, of course, sporty models of both twins would arrive. These were the T100 and Tiger 90. The T100, of course, was a 500cc version and, as the number indicates, was reckoned to be capable of around 100 miles an hour. Somewhere in the mid-90s is actually nearer to the point and the Tiger 90 is probably capable of around 85 miles an hour. These machines usually use better electrical systems than the more modest machines, so it can be that little bit more reliable. And they're really good machines, they're lightweight and nimble, and are excellent on the right sort of road. On larger, more open roads, however, the machines get a little bit buzzy. There's a sort of urban myth that the smaller machines are smoother. This is only true at lower speeds. Believe me, we owned a Tiger 90, and when you rev the nuts off the things, which you really do need to on faster roads, they can get very, very buzzy indeed, Probably worse than 650s in all honesty. The Triumph's ultimate sporting 500 was of course the Daytona, 
This machine was generally capable of just over a tonne, about 105 miles an hour, sometimes more, with its twin carburettors. Although, of course, it commands higher prices, so for the canny buyer, the Tiger 100 is probably the better buy, and having single carburettors, the T100s are a little bit easier to live with. But if you've got the money, a Daytona is an excellent machine. Nimble, fast, if a little bit frantic. Because thankfully by the 1960s, that chassis was much improved. Into the 70s, the Trophy and the Adventurer were the last hurrahs for the 500 twins. These essentially used a BSA Victor frame with the Triumph engine shoehorned into them. And these make great off-road bikes, although the gearing is often a little bit too low for road use. Very sensibly, Triumph wanted to attract younger riders into the fold. So in 1953, they introduced the Terrier. This was 150cc four-stroke single. And the machine really did look like a class act when compared to the Villiers machines that most people would be riding around on at that time. It was a little bit more expensive, however. The Terrier itself was not perfect. It was underpowered and there were a few mechanical issues. So the Terrier would soon give way to the rather more interesting Tiger Cub. This was enlarged out to 200cc and in sports model produced around 10 horsepower and was good for almost 70 miles an hour, which by the standards of that time was pretty good going for a small capacity single. The machine was unit construction just like the Terrier and but incorporated a number of improvements, so it was generally a more reliable machine and also much more common. If you're in the market for small Triumph, the Tiger Cub is much more likely to be the machine that you're going to come across. But by the end of the 60s, the Tiger Cub was out and replaced by a new 250. Well, when I say new, it was actually a rebadged and slightly restyled BSA Starfire, which interestingly itself was actually based on the old Tiger Cub. These don't command particularly high prices, so probably the best buy if you're looking for a sensible, small capacity Triumph. 1949 would see a major change for Triumph as it would usher in the Thunderbird, the company's first 650. It had excellent styling, based on the speed twin of the time. This is an elegant sports touring machine and is very reliable. And of course, as in general with Triumph, less sporty means less vibes and usually a little less money when you're trying to pick one up. Following usual company practice, Triumph introduced a sportier version of the Thunderbird, the Tiger 110, fairly shortly afterwards. The 110 offered great performance with, admittedly, a bit more vibes than the Thunderbird. The only downside was that the sporty nature of the Thunderbird began to expose the shortcomings of Triumph's chassis, because they were not the best at this point, by any means. The Tiger 110 is a great model, but it will command slightly higher prices than the equivalent Thunderbird. That said, what followed on would command even higher prices. So in some ways, the Thunderbird makes a really good buy if you're looking for a sporty Triumph. Early 110s look very similar to Thunderbirds, but as time went by, the machine did get a little bit more sporty looking. Although for real sporty looks, we'd have to wait until the 1960s. 1959 would see the replacement for the 110 at the top of Triumph's range, although the 110 would continue. And this is, of course, the twin carburettor Triumph Bonneville 650. The early models don't look particularly sporty. In fact, they look a little bit conservative in nature. And it was demand from the American market that caused Triumph to restyle the models in 1960 to give us the familiar profile that we know today. But from a buyer's perspective, these very early Bonnevilles, of course, demand very high prices, mainly because of rarity. It did take a while for Triumph to really catch up with demand for this machine. The later machines, of course, do feature chassis improvements so they steer better. They also look rather more sporty and really do have the look of a Triumph Bonneville, at least in the way that we conceive them today. The early 60s would finally see the adoption of unit construction for the Bonnevilles. Many aficionados really prefer the pre-unit bikes and say that they vibrate a bit less than the later unit models. However, the 1968 Bonneville is often said to be the greatest of all Bonnevilles, which probably means it's best to be avoided because it's going to command really high prices. It's a great bike though. If I was buying a 60s Triumph Twin, what would I go for? To be honest, 
I'd probably go for a Trophy or a Tiger 650. Why? Because the Trophy offers almost as much performance as the, as the twin car Bonneville, but with a little bit less force. And in many ways it's more famous, because these are the bikes that Steve McQueen actually used when taking part in the International Six Day Trial. Because when you're doing an event like that, or you're competing in an off-road event, the single car was always preferred. A little bit more reliability, a little bit less fussy, with very similar performance, but a bit more torque. And in fact, largely because of the prowess of the Trophy off-road, in the United States it sold just as well as the Bonneville. Now the late 60s would see the introduction of Triumph's triples. These are fantastic machines and they offer great performance and are probably the bike to go for if you're going to be in a lot of high speed work because they vibrate an awful lot less than the parallel twins do. However they are not without their problems as I've mentioned in previous videos. One of the key problems is they're very collectible because they were only produced in relatively small numbers, around 27,000 in total. And rarity of course brings desirability, so the prices are always going to be that little bit higher. They also need rather more maintenance than a twin and a lot of specialist fettling, and that adds up to running costs. So if you're going to choose a twin or a triple, I would say if it came down to I'm going to have a twin or a triple, then the choice is going to largely come down to finances. Basically, if you want to have a lot of fun, do a lot of tinkering around, but stay solvent, a twin's probably the way to go. If you've got lots of cash and aren't worried too much about the problems, then the triple may be the way to go. They're a very different machine than the twin, but nevertheless they are excellent. The late model T160 is perhaps one of Triumph's most beautiful models, and even included electric start as standard. Woo. Into the 70s, we saw perhaps one of Triumph's least popular models appear, and that is the oil and frame chassis bikes. We've owned an oil and frame bike and actually found it to be very good and not nearly as tall as people make out. They actually aren't too big at all, and my wife was able to fit on one fairly easily. The handling is excellent, the engines are nicely refined, so they're just as good in many ways as a 68 Bonneville, although they don't quite look as nice, which of course means they make excellent buys for the canny second hand buyer. The oil and frame T120 would of course give way to the T140, which despite its name doesn't go anywhere near 140 miles an hour. In fact performance is broadly similar to the 650s, although it does have a good lump of extra torque. Again these are machines which are much maligned by many Triumph aficionados, which can make them canny buys. They're actually pretty good machines, they handle well, they do vibrate a fair bit, but not so much as you might think and they work really good at low RPM, delivering good levels of torque. Handling is excellent, brakes are pretty good, and all round they're an enjoyable bike to own and ride. For me though, the Tiger 750 is the one to go for. It offers similar performance, but again a bit less trouble than the twin carbers. Into the late 70s and early 80s, Tri began to offer a series of factory specials based on the Bonneville platform, mainly because that's all they've got to work with. There were a number of changes and some very nice styling jobs, I have to say, some really striking, and an early go at a factory custom, like the TSX. Obviously this is designed to appeal to the American market, but it's still a pretty good bike for use on the road to Britain too. It's comfortable and fairly reliable by Triumph standards, and I think it looks pretty nice. However, if you want something that's really rare and has a little bit more go, why not go for the TSS? These extremely rare machines, because they were produced in tiny numbers shortly before the factory closed, featured electric start and amazingly a four valve head, although the four valve head is notoriously porous amongst one or two other problems. But that said, it produces around 58 horsepower, so it's a really handy kick and extra performance over the Bonneville. So a great buy, if you can find one. Another little rarity, is the late model Thunderbird. This uses a shorter stroke version of the Bonneville in a single carb, pared down form. These are really nice little bikes. Good torque, great road manners, lovely chassis, and an engine which really behaves very well. Lower vibes, smoother running, and a very nice package, but again, extremely rare. But not particularly desirable, and therefore a really great buy. 
the last hurrah for the original Bonneville came in the form of the T140s built by LF Harris down in Newton Abbott in Devon. You do see these machines on the market from time to time, sometimes really low mileage. And they were built often on more modern machines, so build quality can be very good, at least for some components. So again, these can make very good buys. If only because most of the really classic enthusiasts are not really into the bikes of this era, so if you just want to triumph to ride on the road, they might be a good bet. So if it was me, what Triumph Twin or what Triumph would I go for from the post-war period? It's got to be a single carb bike for me. A Tiger, maybe a TR750, or a Trophy, or even that very low Thunderbird. That's a really nice bike, but probably not one of the sporty twin carb jobs. But then, it's all a matter of personal taste. Some people would really prefer the twin carb because they really want that extra little bit of performance. But for me, I just want something that's a little bit less trouble, and of course, they are a little bit more keenly priced. So what are your thoughts? What machines would you like to buy? What do you think makes a really good Triumph Twin buy? Or any Triumph buy post-war? And also, would you be interested in a part 3 to this video where we look at some of the Hinkley Triumphs? Although, for some people of course, they're not proper Triumphs, but I'm really not getting into that argument. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.